Great, thank you. So welcome to our, um, our webinar on human trafficking um, with our guest, Catherine Luck. Uh, my name is Ann Stevenson, and I am a staff member um, in extension with Youth Development. And my colleague, Elneda Madrigal, is um, we're co-hosting this. And um, this idea kind of generated from a, a new partnership that Youth Development um, is um, creating and having with, uh, with Tubman. And then also sort of as an offshoot of um, work that our central region colleagues did um, in a cohort learning experience all of last year um, around um, how, do we, um, how do we more effectively engage um, new audiences and first generation uh, families and youth and volunteers and partners to working with um, youth development. So um, that's sort of how this sort of generated, and we're very excited. Um, our audience today is is um, interesting to me because um, what began as an idea within youth development uh, made sense to share with our extension colleagues wider, and then from there, it has branched out to um, county partners, to other departments within counties that extension maybe has connected with, um, to schools, and um, in some case, faith-based communities. Um, other partners in um, in our communities. So, and then also um, representation from colleagues in Extension in Iowa. So it's been fun as registrations have been coming in to see how that's been um, the word's been spreading and the great interest. So um, our goal really today is to um, help build awareness of this issue and. Um, equip um, our initial goal was really to help equip our youth development staff to um, be more effective advocates for young people and to understand this problem um, more fully. Um, so I think that's a goal for all of us as people who care about our communities and young people. Um, this webinar will hopefully make us more aware um, and give us some um, resources or tools to understand the problem and our possible roles in helping um, be part of solutions to address it. Um, just a couple um, uh, sort of technical things again. If you experience any problems with technical issues, uh, Todd's email is up there again. So um, just shoot him an email and he'll he'll help support that. And um, I also want to just mention Todd Merkins um, is behind the scenes um, helping make it all, helping make the magic happen today. So thanks, um, Todd, for doing that. And I'd like to turn it over to Alneda now, who will introduce Catherine. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Alneda Madrigal, and I am a program coordinator here at 4-H. And I um, am especially excited about the new 4-H club that we're starting at Tubman. And so we're really glad that Catherine could join us today. And Catherine Luck graduated from the University of Minnesota with a bachelor's degree in neuroscience and a minor in public health. She's interested in how trauma impacts the brain and how that knowledge can be applied to youth development and advocacy. Previously, she served as the East Metro Safe Harbor Regional Navigator, acting as a regional expert for sexually exploited and trafficked youth. In this role, she provided trauma-informed education, services, and technical assistance to county governments, schools, and the community at large. She also did outreach to youth experiencing homelessness and youth in detention centers. Currently, she is a youth violence prevention educator with Tubman, working to assist local middle school and high school students and schools with healthy relationship skill development, service learning, and peer leadership efforts. And Catherine, I will pass it on to you. All right, well, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, I just want to say to everyone watching this that I really appreciate you taking time out of your day to learn about this issue. Um, it definitely does impact us all, as you will see throughout the presentation, and we um, are going to get started. Um, so first and foremost, down to business, I will ex I'll explain explain, um, I'll talk about this slide and then I'll explain kind of what regional navigators do. Um, I did not realize that this was going to go outside of the metro area, so I have only provided the contact information for regional navigators. 
Um, but effectively, what a regional navigator is, is it is one or a couple of people from an organization, it's uh, usually a nonprofit, um, that have uh, been designated as the regional experts. Uh, Minnesota is divided up into 10 regions, um, not counting tribal, not, not counting tribal regions as well. Um, so each regional navigator is in charge of a specific amount of counties and are considered the regional expert on what trafficking looks like in each of those counties. So in the East Metro, which is Anoka, Chisago, Isanti, Dakota, Ramsey, and Washington counties, uh, the regional navigator is the Midwest Children's Resource Center. Um, their 24-hour number is on screen there. Um, just so you know, if you do call after hours, it is a paging system, so they might take a couple of minutes um, to get back to you. If you are in the West Metro, um, we have the link. Um, they have 24-7 access at that number. That um, phone is monitored constantly by the regional navigator, so um, they should be picking up as soon as you call. Um, outside of the metro area, you can find your regional navigators and their contact information if you go to um, uh, the MDH's website, uh, or you can just Google Safe Harbor Regional Navigators Minnesota and type in your county, and it will direct you to the person who would most be able to assist you in your area. Um, regional navigators do a little bit of everything. They do education, they do training, they do advocacy, um, they wear many hats, so it's worth it to have them be your first call if you suspect or are concerned about a youth or a young adult that's going through trafficking. And we'll talk about the signs um, about what that might look like later in the presentation. Um, so I'm going to start us off by using, um, by throwing some introduction questions to you out there. So what are some stereotypes that you've heard about trafficking, or what are some facts that you might know? Um, if you look at the bottom of your screen, there's a discussion pod where you can type in just kind of your thoughts. Um, I'd just like to understand um, a baseline of where we're starting from. Yes, so um, one of the thoughts that has come in is it's prevalent at the Mall of America. Um, it's more, there's an idea that it's more of a metro problem. We'll discuss that. We'll definitely talk about the mall. Um, starting with really young girls, for sure. Increased intensity with sporting events. We will definitely talk about the Super Bowl. Uh, Native American youth, we will talk about that too, but we know that um, the rates for Native American youth are disproportionate compared to the general population. It definitely does happen in small towns. We'll talk about that. It might look different, but it does. Yeah, so I think um, I'm impressed by the amount of information that we're starting out with. I'm really excited to uh, address uh, things that come forward. We will definitely be talking about lots of the things that you brought up. We'll be talking about the Super Bowl. We'll be talking about intersections with experiencing homelessness um, and other, it definitely happens in small communities as well as the metro area. It's an equal opportunity problem. So in order to start out um, talking about trafficking, we have to understand um, legally kind of what we're looking at and then work from there. Um, so there's a federal definition of trafficking that we'll talk about, and then there's a Minnesota definition as well. Minnesota's definition, as you see, will, as you see in a little bit, is a much more broad than the federal definition, but it's important for us to understand both. Um, so this all kind of started out of the, we all, we like to start from the Trafficking Victims Protection Act of 2000, um, which defines um, sex trafficking, 
like a severe form of sex trafficking is a crime in which a commercial sexual act is induced by force, fraud, or coercion, or in which the person induced to perform such an act has not attained 18 years of age. So this is all a little bit legal easy, so we'll break it down so, um, so it makes sense for everyone. Um, Commercial Sex Act um, is the first thing that we need to talk about in the federal definition. Commercial Sex Act mean, um, meaning some sort of sex act is exchanged for money specifically. Um, if someone is under the age of 18, even if they say they are consenting and they're willing to do the activity for money, it is considered trafficking, but over 18 years of age when they are an adult, um, people need to show that there was force, fraud, or coercion some sort of trickery or pressure or, um, or some way, um, some other um, sort of pressuring someone into doing that life if they are over the age of 18. Um, so when we are talking about federal trafficking, they are looking for three sorts of things. They're looking for the process, the means, and the end. So the process is how did how did a trafficker obtain a person? How were they recruited for this job? How were they um, kept? How were they moved around or transported? Um, means, meaning what is, why are they staying, why are they continuing to stay in this um, job even though it's harmful? And again, if someone is over the age of 18, um, the means has to be by force or fraud or coercion. Force could look like um, threatening someone's family. Uh, fraud oftentimes looks like um, saying that you can bring someone over to America um, and get them a job and provide them a better life, and then uh, withholding visas, and then coercion, sort of trickery, saying um, it'll make you famous, um, it'll, you'll, you can do all of these other things. So one of those things has to be there. Um, and then we have to understand what purpose was this person tricked into. Was it involuntary servitude, debt bondage, slavery, or sex trade? Um, when we talk about trafficking, um, for most of this presentation, we will be talking about sex trafficking. But it also definitely happens. Um, there's also labor trafficking as well, which is of particular concern when we talk about um, farming, um, communities as well. Um, one of the, I would say, most prevalent labor trafficking cases that's happened in the United States happened down in Florida. A recruiter for labor trafficking would find vulnerable people who are outside of a homeless shelter um, and invite them to work on, uh, work on their farms and provide them a place to stay. Um, and then while they weren't allowed to leave this compound. Um, and then after they left that compound, or after they tried to leave, uh, the trafficker had a commissary sort of store where uh, people could buy all of their things from the employer, like toothbrush, toothbrushes and food and deodorant. But the trafficker also provided um, different types of drugs in the commissary. Um, knowing that many people experiencing homelessness were incredibly vulnerable to chemical use or had been using chemicals in the past, um, which was how they kept and continued keeping people on that farm. I believe that case happened a couple of years ago. I don't remember the um, names, though, but you can Google that. But again, um, we're going to be focusing on sex trafficking. Um, so process means an end, again, when we're talking about federal uh, trafficking. So these are some questions that someone might ask as they're building a trafficking case process. How and why did this person leave home or a safe environment? Um, how did a person, how did this person find out about the job? How was it advertised, quote unquote? Um, means, what happened when they arrived in the destination? Uh, what was it like when they started to work? And then ends, was the person paid? How much? How often? Um, what happens if the person tries to leave their job? Um, if they try to leave, and was the person in, afraid of their employer? Why or why not? So again, these can be applicable both to sex trafficking and labor trafficking. Um, so now we talk about Minnesota's definition. So 
Minnesota, um, let's talk about the laws around Minnesota first. Uh, so the first safe harbor law was passed in New York State in 2008. Minnesota was the third state to pass a law in 2011 that went into effect in 2014. Uh, it was the first state to dedicate funding to services. So safe harbor law, there's sort of two portions um, that you'll, you'll hear talked about when we talk about um, sex trafficking in Minnesota. Uh, the safe harbor part of that uh, effectively decriminalizes prostitution for minors under the age of 18. Um, this means that they can't be picked up and put in jail for, um, for prostitution. Um, as a side note, uh, when we are talking about victims of human trafficking, they should not be called um, child prostitutes because they are victims. Um, sometimes, um, though, that terminology can get mixed up. So just to be clear, we don't um, call um, victims of trafficking prostitutes at all. Um, so again, that safe harbor law will decriminalize um, prostitution for minors under 18, under the age of 18. It also puts, um, puts um, trafficked youth into child protection codes, making, it, making sure that they access, are able to access services. Um, and then speaking of services, that's kind of the second portion of the law. You might hear the term no wrong door thrown around. Uh, no Wrong Door is like a program philosophy, if you will, um, that whenever a youth discloses whoever they choose to disclose to, they should be able to access these services equally. So services should be provided regardless of how or where youth disclose an experience, whether that means they're disclosing to a worker, a social worker, whether they're disclosing to a probation officer, whether they're disclosing to a teacher or a friend. Um, Regardless of where that disclosure is coming from, they should be able to access those services. So mo more often than not, um, what that means is connecting with your region's regional navigator, um, who will be able to provide further assistance and specifics into each case. So Minnesota's state definition um, uh, for minor, minor commercial sexual exploitation. Uh, so this occurs when someone under the age of 18 engages in commercial sexual activity. A commercial sexual activity occurs when anything of value or a promise of anything of value, such as money, drugs, food, shelter, rent, or higher status in a gang or group, is given to a person by any means in exchange for any type of sexual activity. A third party may or may not be involved. So again, there's a lot there and we're going to break it down. Um, first and foremost, in the Minnesota definition, um, they are saying a commercial sexual activity occurs when anything of value um, is traded. So in the federal definition, it had to be money. We, um, but in the Minnesota definition, it's, it can be anything that a youth considers of value. So money could definitely be one of those things. Um, but again, um, I sort of divide, um, divide them into three sorts of categories, the first being basic needs. So if a youth is trading sexual, act sexual favors for shelter or food, um, we call that survival sex. So they're sort of trading, um, engaging in sexual activity in order to get their basic needs met. Um, the second sort of ex uh, category that I consider is more what we might consider luxury items. Luxury meaning um, getting your nails done, getting your hair done, um, drugs and alcohol, um, probably not necessary basic needs wise for youth. Um, so I put them in that category as well. Um, and so these, these two, the first two groups are pretty common and e uh, easy for workers to spot if they are asking the right questions. Um, the third group I consider one, one of the more difficult groups to identify, and that's when youth are trading sexual activity for non-tangible things. Um, so nothing maybe physically is being traded, but so some exam the example that's given on screen is a higher status in a gang or a group. Um, so that might look like a youth engaging in sexual activity with a teacher for higher grades because the youth considers grades to be uh, valuable and important. 
um, that might be considered um, like acceptance into a friend group um, saying, oh, if you engage, if you do these things with this person, then you can be friends with us. So trading sex for popularity maybe in that situation. Um, oftentimes in the suburbs and in uh, more rural areas, it might look like youth engaging in sexual activity to get into a party. Um, saying you have to do these things, otherwise you can't come in, we can't give you beer, all that type of stuff. Um, so again, entrance into a party, not maybe a tangible thing, but still um, the youth is trading sex for something that they consider of value. Um, finally, um, so you can see how maybe this definition is definitely a lot broader than the federal definition and a lot more things could be considered trafficking. Uh, another thing that comes up sometimes um, when certain groups are hazing, specific types of hazing, when it does involve sexual activity can also be considered sex trafficking as well. Uh, and then one other thing of note in this definition, it also says when the promise of anything of value um, is exchanged for sexual activity. So as soon as someone says, uh, I, um, you can stay on my couch tonight, um, I'll provide you shelter, you just have to do me this favor, that is considered sex trafficking. Even if the favor hasn't been performed yet, even if the shelter hasn't been um, provided yet, um, as soon as that promise is made, it is considered trafficking. Um, so nothing tangible or physical necessarily has to be exchanged um, for it to be considered trafficking. Um, I want to take a minute to pause here um, and uh, talk in the discussion group. Are there any other que are there any questions about the definitions of trafficking in Minnesota or federally? Okay, then we will move on. So I'm sure that in while you are while you're listening to me talk about uh, things that youth might trade for things of value, you are definitely aware of other things um, that youth might also be trading in exchange um, in exchange um, for sexual activity, effectively. Um, most, if not all, of these things um, will be considered will can be considered trafficking under law. Um, so, just kind of some understanding and updates. Um, when we talk about safe harbor service funds, originally uh, seven hundred thousand um, dollars was went towards funding training law enforcement prosecutors and other frontline um, systems professionals who regularly encountered sexually exploited youth. Um, and then there are also housing specific shelter, or sec, uh, sexually exploited youth specific shelters and housing options, um, sexually exploited youth um, medical providers who deal specifically with trauma. Um, so a lot of those um, safe harbor services are very trauma informed and also across the network. Again, your regional navigator will be able to connect you to those resources. So Minnesota was the first state in the nation to consider um, to have a statewide director of child sex trafficking prevention through um, the Minnesota Department of Health. Uh, and originally, we had six regional navigator positions. Um, this just means, effectively, that Minnesota sees this as a public health problem. Um, updates more recently, um, we have uh, been funded uh, an additional $2.1 million more dollars for sh more shelter and housing for these youth for street outreach, so people going out into the street um, and meeting with youth um, and maybe providing services that way. Other supportive services like medical, legal um, services, um, case management services, and protocol development. Um, protocol development just means that there are counties um, in the area who are trying to figure out what they want their um, response to sexually exploited youth to be because 
because this is a relatively new law, there's still a lot of troubleshooting and trying to figuring out what does that look like. Um, we also know that um, with uh, youth experiencing trafficking, um, they don't really care about county lines. They're going to go where they, uh, where they um, can meet up with people. Uh, they're going to go where they can find a safe place to stay for the night, and they don't really care about those counties or, in some cases, even state laws if you're close enough to the border. Um, so uh, building a trafficking case in Minnesota uh, is very multi-jurisdictional, um, so they have, they've also put money towards that sort of training as well. Um, something that you will notice, um, one other thing that they updated in 2015 was that they decided to allow youth who were up to the age of 24 to access Safe Harbor supportive services. However, um, you'll notice that the original Safe Harbor law only, um, only uh, protects people who are under the age of 18. So youth in that 18 to 24 range, who we would technically consider legally adults, um, are still able to be charged with prostitution. Um, so within this past uh, legislative session, um, there was a legislative mandate to start strategic planning for safe harbor for all. So people are now starting to ask the questions, what does it look like to decriminalize prostitution for youth up to the age of 24? Um, we aren't sure at this point in time um, what, what we have now with youth under the age of 18 is known as the Nordic model. If you're interesting, interested in understanding more about what that looks like um, with uh, the decriminalization of, sec of prostitution for folks. Um, so that is um, well worth your time if you're interested in that. Um, as of May 23rd, 2017, reports of sex trafficking should be made to child protection. Um, this is sort of contentious with advocates, um, just because we, uh, as we'll talk about later in the presentation, it can be very difficult for us um, to, um, <clears throat> it can be very difficult for us to gain the trust of these youth um, for multitudes of reasons. And if they're not interested in reporting, but we are, um, we are legally required to do certain types of reporting, it can break the trust that adults um, have with these um, vulnerable youth. Um, I do want to make the distinction that um, in Minnesota, sexual exploitation and sex trafficking are different. Sexual exploitation um, can occur any, when anyone is um, when anyone is trading sex for anything. Um, a third party is not required. Sex trafficking requires that third party. So what we would classically call the pimp or the trafficker, that is considered sex trafficking, and that should be reported to child protection. But if you know that a youth is maybe engaging in survival sex um, or uh, exploiting themselves, perhaps, that's not a child protection report. Um, if you are confused, you can definitely call child protection and pose them hypothetical questions um, to see if it would be a report or not. But it's something that we're still talking about in the, community, in the um, advocacy community as well. So now we actually have to talk about what it, trafficking looks like in Minnesota. Again, I said we were focusing mainly on sex trafficking. Um, but typically, labor trafficking victims report being domestic workers, such as nannies or housekeepers. Um, you may have heard the news story of uh, there was a woman in Woodbury, Minnesota, who was keeping um, a housekeeper that she brought over from her with uh, from China and was um, for, like abusing her and making her sleep on the floor. Um, and g generally just treating her poorly. Um, so that's probably one of the classical labor trafficking sort of victims that we've seen in Minnesota. Um, we haven't seen too many of them, though, I would say, which doesn't mean it's not happening. It's just we haven't been reported on that many situations. Um, also, sex trafficking victims in Minnesota report exploitation through systems of prostitution, um, which we will talk, which we've talked about and will continue to talk about. Servile marriage, oftentimes that can look like someone saying, 
I am I'm the dominant partner. I take care of you, and because I take care of you and I love you a lot, this is what you need to do. This is how you need to provide for the family. Um, forced stripping. Uh, sometimes when um, people are not making enough money out on the streets, um, generally traffickers um, set a quota for a, an amount of money that um, um, victims need to make every night. Um, so sometimes if victims are not making making that quota on a regular basis, um, traffickers will force those um, those people to also work in strip clubs as well to supplement their income um, and make up make up that money um, that quota to meet that quota. Uh, and then pornography as well. It is pretty common um, for traffickers to require um, require their victims to record any encounters with um, with clients that they might have and then um, post them for monetary benefit or gain later. So if we're talking about statewide facts and statistics, uh, when we were talking in the beginning about some stereotypes that came up, um, I was surprised that no one mentioned that there's an idea of like, we think about Taken with Liam Neeson, we think about um, people, uh, young children from, young girls specifically, uh, in third world countries being brought over in shipping containers and chained to their beds. And I'm not going to say that doesn't happen, but 90% um, of human trafficking victims within um, the Minnesota area were born and raised in Minnesota. 90% of these victims are American citizens is effectively what that means. Uh, most people have, um, most victims of human trafficking, um, I think human trafficking is a bit of a misnomer actually. It makes it sound like people are moving around uh, a lot from country to country. Um, trafficking, can, um, trafficking, can, trafficking can definitely occur from country to country, from state to state, um, and from county to county. But it is also entirely possible for someone to be born and raised and trafficked in the same county. Um, and they don't have to go anywhere. Um, some other information of note, uh, we have to talk about the intersections. 100% of the folks that we work with have experienced complex trauma. And what that means is we're not working with people who wake up one day and say, I want to trade um, sex for money. We are working with people who have histories of domestic violence, who have histories of experiencing homelessness, who have histories of um, child sexual abuse, um, and all other different types of trauma as well. Um, which maybe has limited their choices um, in life so that they feel like um, child uh, that so that they feel like trafficking themselves or exploiting themselves is a viable option. So when we talk about trafficking or any type of violence, we have to consider it from an ecological. We use an ecological approach, um, and what that effectively means is we have to look at um, this as a public health issue, um, and there are all sorts of risk and protective factors at all different levels. So. Um, any one of these uh, levels or things doesn't um, make someone more inclined to be a victim of violence or to use violence, um, but many of these things coming together might explain where they're coming from. Uh, so with the ecological approach, we start out with the individual. Um, so was that individual the victim of child maltreatment? Do they have untreated mental health um, that isn't being addressed? Do they have untreated chemical health that's not being addressed? Um, is there a history of violence within that youth specifically? Uh, and then we look outward to their relationships. Um, what, did, what did their family life look like? What, what did their friends treat them like? Was violence very normalized um, between the parents and from parent to child? Um, what is there potentially um, the normalization of violence within friends, like that's how your friends act, so that's how you might act as well. Uh, and then we look out even further into the community. Um, is there higher rates of poverty? Are there high crime levels? 
Uh, are people moving around a lot? What does economic opportunity look like? And then finally, we'll, we look out society-wide. What does society say about my race, my gender, my ethnicity, my sexuality? Um, and all of these things are potential risk factors for someone experiencing trafficking, but we also know that some of these things can also be protective factors as well. Um, everything that I've talked about, it's definitely not an exhaustive list. There are definitely many other factors at w any of those levels that I did not discuss, but I'm sure you can think of some as well. So when we talk about sex trafficking, we have to collaborate with partners. Uh, and what that means um, is because we know that uh, people have experienced, people who are experiencing complex trauma, so people who are experiencing domestic violence, experiencing homelessness, experiencing sexual assault or child sexual abuse, are, those are leading risk factors for experiencing commercial sexual exploitation or trafficking. Um, so all of Tubman services have been intentionally designed for youth who have experienced trafficking or at, or are at risk for trafficking. Because trafficking um, covers such a wide net, um, we, if we focus our programs on trafficking, we are also able to work with victims of domestic violence and victims of um, um, homelessness and sexual assault. Um, so general findings that inform our work, we know that over half of community youth we've surveyed do not recognize abusive behaviors as being abusive, um, which really speaks to um, the normalization of violence that potentially um, happens with, um, within society. Um, and then over 70% of youth said they would tell a friend before anyone else about the abuse or violence. And what that means is we as adults can definitely be aware of this issue and um, talk, um, talk to the youth in our lives and build connections with them. But really, it's um, important for us to inform youth of this issue so that they also know what to look for in their friends and family members, because it's more likely that a friend is going to disclose to another friend than um, someone is going to disclose to an adult. So I really want, I'm really grateful to the Fridley students that are watching this and getting informed, because um, you're going to be able to do a lot more um, impact than maybe some of the adults um, can. Um, so we have to definitely talk about homelessness um, when we talk about human trafficking. Studies of youth who trade sex show that violence and homelessness is incredibly common. Um, 39,000 children under the age of 18 who run away or have one homeless episode are sexually assaulted or exploited. And up to 30% of youth on streets or in shelters have been victimized by sex trafficking. Um, and let's really talk about that last bullet point for a second, because effectively <clears throat> what that means is if there are three youth in your community who are experiencing homelessness maybe tonight. Um, statistically, one of them will be approached um, by a trafficker tonight. Um, so just to really put that in perspective, um, it's incredibly common. Um, because traffickers recognize that those youth are particular, particularly vulnerable. Um, we also can't talk about trafficking without also talking about domestic violence. Um, domestic violence, sexual assault, child abuse, and human trafficking are not voluntary and violate a person's freedom. Um, and so many people uh, watching this webinar might say, well, that's quite obvious, Catherine. Um, but sometimes we get, might get caught on victim blaming, whether or not we mean to, and say, why didn't they just leave? Why didn't they just stop having sex? Why didn't they just get out? Um, and so they're choosing to be there. So it's really important for me to start off by reminding people that people are not choosing to be there. Um, things are keeping them there, but it doesn't mean they want to be there. Um, most people who have been victimized experience post-traumatic stress disorder, brain injuries, and other forms of trauma. So um, we can be trained to work with um, victims of domestic violence. We can be trained to work with victims of child abuse. Um, we can do all those trainings separately. Or if we um, just approach it um, from a general sort of trained to be trauma-informed and uh, provide trauma-informed care, you're sort of covering the whole gamut of issues. 
Um, additionally, domestic violence and sexual assault, like those two, trafficking relates to power, control, exploitation, and oppression. So again, um, when we talk about trafficking, sometimes we focus on the sexual activity. Like, oh, we just need to stop them from having sex and going out on dates is what um, they're referred to commonly as. Um, but if we focus on the sex, that's certainly, there's certainly one, there's certainly some merit in that. Um, but if we only focus on the sex, we are not focusing on all of the other power structures that are keeping a youth there. Um, so again, that power, that control, and that oppression. Um, and then finally, the needs of people who have been victimized can be similar. They're looking for safe housing, confidentiality, health services, and other social services. Um, and this one is on there particularly because um, sometimes when I was in my previous job working with victims of trafficking, um, people who had domestic violence training or sexual assault training would come up to me and say, well, you know, I, I don't know how to work with these youth. They're so different. Their needs are so different and they're so great. So this bullet point is really on there as a reminder that um, if we, that the youth probably are going to want the same things as the youth that you maybe are already working with. Um, so their, their needs are, might be different, um, but for the most part, it's important to um, ask them. Uh, additionally, many youth that um, have experienced trafficking do not like being called victims of human trafficking. Um, so if we label them like victims of human trafficking, they're less likely to want to work with us because we're stig we, they feel like we're stigmatizing them, vi uh, victimizing them in another way, um, and not fully hearing them and seeing them as like full human beings. So it's important for us as we work with people of all types of trauma to also keep in mind that we don't want to define any one person by their trauma. They're not just a victim of sex trafficking. They are many, many other things as well. Um, so trends that we are seeing, we're seeing all youth of all genders. Um, we definitely have to talk about LGBTQ youth. Um, we know that these youth are at higher risk just because um, if they live in families or environments that are not accepting of their sexuality and they come out, um, they are, it's likely that sometimes it occurs that they get thrown out of their house um, and they have nowhere else to go. So LGBTQ youth are at risk if they don't have a supportive environment, a supportive safe environment to come to. Um, I also mentioned boys because um, we know that uh, there we know that there are many many uh, female victim, female identified victims of human trafficking. Um, but a study by the World Health Organization in the early 2000s found that globally. Boys are trafficked at equal, if not higher, rates to girls. And that's super, and we're not seeing that in advocacy. Probably um, there are plenty of reasons that we might not, but one of the biggest things is there's shame and there's stigma around um, boys, um, boys experiencing any type of victimization, but especially sexualized victimization. Um, so it's really important for us to remember um, that all, that all youth um, can potentially be vulnerable, not just girls. Um, homeless and runaway youth, that is important um, to note because a lot of the times if youth are homeless or running away, they don't have, um, they don't, youth generally don't have a lot of resources. So they're not able to just provide for, um, so they're not able to just pay for things outright, so they're willing to do things in order to get those needs met. So homeless and runaway youth. Uh, survival sex is common. Again, trading sex um, or sexual activity for shelter or food or just a warm, warm place to stay at night. Especially in Minnesota, we know these winters can be really cold. Um, so that's something that comes up. Uh, again, 90% are US born, but we are seeing a d disproportionate number of African American and Native youth which is not to say that this doesn't happen in white communities or in Asian communities or other racial or um, communities like that. 
It might be that these youth have access to other services and are never coming to us, or it might be that they don't recognize that they're experiencing trauma. It's um, very normal for them, so they're not choosing to come forward, or there's shame or stigma around coming forward. Um, and then, of course, we cannot talk about trafficking without also talking about abuse or exploitation that occurs through technology. Um, so sexting, social media, back page, pornography, arrangements over the internet. Um, one thing that I like to talk about is dating apps. I had uh, someone that I was working with would frequently just go on Tinder, which is a dating site, um, and would message people and say, hey, let's meet up. We can do these things if you buy me a pack of cigarettes. Um, so technology, while ha it has provided us an, a lot more connectivity and access to um, different communities, it has also that's been somewhat of a double-edged sword because it makes it easier for other people to find that. Um, sample factors related to exploitation. So this was adopted from the Girls Education and Mentoring Services. So these are just some ways that um, some ways that a youth might end up in a situation where they are being approached by a trafficker. Um, so it starts very young, linking with the linking of love, sex, and abuse um, during child sexual abuse. Um, there's definitely a violation of boundaries there. Uh, and then there's guilt and shame, especially if uh, a youth um, is being abused by someone who says they care about them and love them a lot and says, um, this is how I show love to you, but you can't tell anyone else or they won't believe you and you'll be in trouble. So a lot of that guilt and shame. Um, they might view themselves as a sexual object in terms of saying, well, this is how I show and receive love. Um, this is what I'm good for. Um, again, uh, linking to that maybe potentially with low self-esteem. Um, maybe at that point in time they've decided they've had enough and they run away and they are experiencing homelessness because they have nowhere else to go. Um, again, oftentimes youth don't have access to a lot of money, um, so there's poverty and that might create a need where someone might um, begin engaging in um, survival sex or trying to find someone who will pick them up and take care of them in exchange for sexual favors. Um, and generally, it's adults doing that or older people. Um, and it, when a person is, when a young person is in a relationship with an adult, there's definitely an unequal power dynamic there. Um, media influences also take it um, um, should be factored in. Um, we, if you think about the movie Pretty Woman, it made it glamorous. It made it look glamorous to be um, in the life. Um, like someone will come rescue you. Um, so that's perpetuated that idea. Uh, demand, we know the sex industry is uh, estimated to be valued around $9 billion in the United States um, and $99 billion worldwide. Um, people are willing to pay for um, other people. Um, people are willing to pay for porn. People are willing to pay for um, to go into strip clubs. So all of that. Um, fuels that demand. Um, and then finally, at that point, someone, um, a recruiter or a pimp or a trafficker might approach a youth. Um, it is important to note that in the middle there, um, when they are experiencing homelessness and there's that poverty and need and they're engaging in survival sex um, on their own, they're still considered sexually exploited. Um, it's only um, when the recruiter or the pimp or the trafficker approaches them that that is considered trafficking. But um, victims who are engaging in sexual exploitation on their own are still in need of help. So here are some things that you should look for when we are talking about um, trafficking. Um, any one of these signs on their own is not problem, uh, it shouldn't be an issue, but if you see three or four of these coupled with maybe a gut feeling that something feels off, it's important to um, check in with someone, maybe consult with your regional navigator or someone else who has this expertise. Um, so if they, if students or if youth have a friend or a mentor or a pastor or a parent that they seem a lot closer to than uh, would 
be normal or maybe average for someone of their age, that could potentially be a sign. Um, I, if they have close relationships, that's totally fine and normal. Um, it becomes problematic when these relationships start to be a little bit controlling about what they can do with their time. Um, a common narrative um, that we see is the older boyfriend. If someone has a partner who is much older than them, that's potentially a sign. Um, oftentimes, recruiters will approach youth not as recruiters, but uh, as potential romantic interests and say, look, um, I, look, you're really pretty, you're really special, let me take care of you, I care about you, and then um, they gain the victim's trust that way. Um, so many times victims see their traffickers as their boyfriends. Um, so other terms that you might hear, boyfriends, daddies, um, just other sort of like pet names that someone might call their own spouse or partner as well. So they're very, they're very rarely going to say, this is my trafficker. Um, school absences, many of these times youth are not, um, maybe not comfortable at school or have decided that school is useless for them because they can just make money doing what they're doing now so they don't need to go to school. Um, Ramsey County definitely catches a lot of youth um, who are experiencing exploitation because they're not showing up in school, so the through the truancy system. Um, so that's a warning sign. Travel to vague locations, as if uh, a youth says to you, oh, I was in Chicago last week, and then um, Duluth the week before, and then you ask, oh, what were you doing there? And they can't provide you with concrete information. That's potentially a sign. Um, if they are fearful of certain groups of people, uh, for example, I worked with someone who was trafficked uh, by the gang, the Latin Kings. So she was very fearful of people who appeared uh, Latino or Latina because that's what her traffickers looked like. Um, if there are multiple strangers staying at their home, um, if they talk about multiple partners, um, they brag about multiple partners, um, that's potentially a sign. House parties, again, that's very common in the suburbs and maybe in some more rural areas um, where youth are maybe trading sex to get into the party or someone might say, hey, my friend is packed out in the room next door. If you want to have sex with them, you can pay me 20 bucks or something like that. Um, it happens more than you think. Um, if they have multiple phones, um, that's potentially a sign. Or if um, they, their phones are constantly being taken away and they always manage to procure, procure a phone, that's potentially a sign. Uh, free lodging, rides, or gifts. All of these might be indicative of someone in that grooming phase uh, where the trafficker is trying to gain someone's trust and providing them all sorts of nice things. Um, um, so those are all potential signs. If they're chronically running not only from school but also from home, that's a sign because we want to know where are you staying, who are you staying with, um, and what do you have to do to stay there types of things. If they're vague on the details surrounding money, so you ask, oh, where did you, where did you get that, um, all these new like Armani clothes and shoes and stuff, and they don't have a really great reason um, for it, that's potentially a sign. Uh, drivers, um, I had, I've worked with a youth who had a different driver every day of the school week, and so a different driver would pick her up from school, she'd go um, be trafficked in the cities and then dropped off back at home on her own at, in the evening. Uh, if you notice Backpage or other personal ads that might be a little more explicit, promising meeting up for engaging in stuff, that's potentially a sign. Um, if you notice other bruises or other physical trauma, um, many times once someone is engaging in the life, their trafficker uh, will provide them rewards but will also punish them physically as well. Um, when we also talk about physical trauma, it's rather normal for traffickers to tattoo their victims with their name to like brand their property. So if they have a new tattoo of a name or something like that, you should check in about that. Um, inappropriate dress based on the weather and surroundings. If you have someone, a youth, just walking around outside in their underwear, it's worth checking in as to why. Uh, chemical use, either oftentimes um, there, there are certain traffickers who like to get their victims hooked on chemicals and then say, if you want more of this drug, you have to make money for me. 
Um, other times it might look like someone using chemicals in order to cope with all of the trauma that they're going through, um, all of the people that they're um, experiencing. And then finally, um, knowledge of sexual situations beyond a normal age. Um, so for example, if you've got like a 10 or 11 year old who knows um, a lot about how to post videos on Pornhub or other sorts of like sexually explicit sites, that's potentially a sign. And again, any one of these things on their own is not problematic, um, but just um, a couple of these paired with like a gut feeling that something's off or odd, you should definitely check in with someone else. Um, so what do you think, why do you think it's so difficult for youth to come forward if they've experienced trafficking? Um, we've talked a lot about a different a reason, so if you want to talk about those in the discussion. Yes, absolutely. Shame is a big one, right? Um, shame, especially because we live in maybe a society that frowns upon youth sexuality at all. So it's hard to admit that, hey, I've been engaging in sex with multiple people for money. Shame. Fear is also a big one. Fear that they won't be believed. Um, sometimes fear that um, Fear that they'll be arrested for a crime. Not all youth know about the safe harbor law and they think they can get in trouble for it. Uh, sometimes traffickers will make their victims commit some sort of crime and so that they can, so that the traffickers can hold the fear of the police over the head, um, over the victim's heads and say, oh, if you go to the police and ask for help, then I'll tell the police that you did all of these bad things and then they'll arrest you. Um, being blamed for what happened is completely normal, saying that Oh, I, I agreed to go on these dates, so it's my fault. They, if they don't know the resources, that's definitely one. Maybe it's all they know. Um, we know that just like in family, in like families where a grandparent is a doctor and then a parent is a doctor, the youth might want to be more likely to be a doctor. Um, when we, uh, in the same way, if the grandparent uh, was in the life and then the parent was in the life, the youth would be more inclined to be in the life. And then finally, maybe, yeah, they're, they finally feel like they're accepted and they're loved, someone's taking care of them, someone's meeting their needs. Um, youth, um, we know that it's super, super important for them to feel like they belong somewhere. And if they feel like they don't belong anywhere, um, and someone says, I love you, I'm taking care of you, this is, this is it, um, that's, totally, that's totally an option as well. Um, a lot of, one other one is maybe youth don't recognize, uh, maybe don't even recognize that they're being trafficked, right? Because if they're being told this is how, this is how youth, um, this, is how, this is how relationships are and that kind of stuff, it can be hard if they don't know any better. So all sorts of reasons for sure. Um, so these are a bit more about uh, Tubman services. I think for the sake of time, we'll skip past them. We can definitely talk about them um, if you have questions about them. But um, so we know that it's hard for us to keep youth from running. If youth are not ready to leave the life, they're going to probably take off from wherever they are. Um, wherever they are, like whether that's with, at home, whether that's at school, whether that's foster family, anything like that. Um, so a lot of these youth, they have experienced a lot of trauma and they are afraid to trust a lot of people because maybe the person that they do trust has treated them this way. Um, so it's important for us to be patient. Um, working with these youth takes a lot of time and a lot of energy um, and a lot of patience. Um, youth want to know that you are a trustworthy person um, and they can share stuff with you and you're not going to judge them or snitch, quote unquote, uh, before they tell you about some of the bigger stuff that's going on in their lives. Um, so one of the most important things we can do to work with these youth is 
build healthy relationships with them, build healthy appropriate relationships with them. Um, because maybe they've never had one before, or maybe the adult relationships in their life have not been healthy um, before. And so if you break that cycle, you are providing a lot of help and support for them. Um, so, and that mentorship and that building trust, um, it's foundational to the work that we do. If you don't have that trust and that relationship, youth are not going to want to work with you. Um, so the good news is, once you have that foundation and you show that you're a trustworthy person, um, we, we see some amazing things happening. 90% um, of the youth that we serve have met three or more ident of their identified goals uh, within 10 weeks of working with someone at Tubman. Um, youth that were seeking therapy, shelter, or other needs received them. Um, youth, serve, uh, youth serve requesting protection orders can file them as well, um, just making sure that we are um, letting them set goals for themselves. Because when we cast out as adults and we say, look, this is, these, look at all the things that you can do, look in, and look at all the steps that you might have to take, and it might take work, but I'll be there with you through it. Um, youth will do amazing things. Um, so we want to talk about uh, prevention and outreach as well. 90% of the girls we've served who identify as being sexually exploited have not previously reported the violence. So again, it's important for us to be people that they feel like they can trust, um, and that's not going to judge them. 60%, um, uh, nearly six out of every 10 girls served by our outreach and intervention services request support because of being sexually exploited. But again, they're not going to say, I am sexually exploited. They might tell us about a situation and say, oh, I need help with that. But they're not going to label themselves, and we should work to not label them either. Uh, and approximately one in three girls who have been exploited report having a same past, uh, have report having a past or present same-sex partner. So again, being aware of the intersections with, um, in, within the LGBTQ community as well. 55% of the girls served have at least one child because we know if people um, are if people are engaging in a lot of unprotected sex, um, pregnancy is entirely possible. Um, and again, there's that complex uh, trauma history behind that. Um, girls receiving services report lack of hope and instability of friends or family playing a role in their victimization. Many describe friends and family as playing a role in exploiting them. Um, so one of the common, common narratives that we see, again, is that older boyfriend. We don't always talk about peer-to-peer -peer recruitment. Or when a friend says, hey, I know that you're couch hopping and you're in a rough situation. I can connect you with someone. He's great. He takes care of me and he can take care of you too. Um, we have to be aware of also of that peer-to-peer -peer recruiting and then maybe family recruiting as well. Um, and then girls report being approached about exchanging sex for money, basic necessities, and other promises an average of twice a day in some Minnesota location hotspots. Um, peer to peer, um, so with those hotspots, um, someone mentioned earlier the Mall of America. That's incredibly common because, yes, there are a lot of youth at the Mall of America. So there are a lot of traffickers who are looking for youth at the mall as well. Um, other places that they hang out, high school football games, schools, youth homeless shelters, just anywhere that they know youth are going to be. Um, other hotspots that you might have heard of include Lake Street and some parts of University Avenue. Um, so I talked a little bit about hotspot locations in Minnesota, um, but I think we do a disservice when we talk about hotspots because we um, Maybe we're not talking about the locations where people are experiencing a lot of trafficking, um, but they're not coming forward as much, so it doesn't seem like a hot spot. Um, and as for how common is peer-to-peer -peer recruitment, um, we don't really have good numbers for that, unfortunately. Um, but it is just as, um, it's pretty likely that especially when someone is experiencing homelessness, um, their friend might be able to help them out in some way, whether that's um, getting them to a service provider or getting them to a trafficker. Um, youth identifying as male, currently only 2% of male youth independently seek services as victims through our outreach programs to homeless youth. 
Um, but it's estimated that one in six male youth have experienced sexual abuse, and 100% of the five male youth ages 12 and under in the past 10 years who entered residential had histories of sexual abuse. So we know it's happening to boys, um, but boys are not necessarily coming forward and disclosing to us because they don't feel safe, because they don't, maybe it's because they don't feel safe, maybe it's because they don't feel recognized, um, or they don't recognize it as um, behavior. I worked with a youth um, whose father was doing the exploiting um, and was saying, you know, this is how you become a man. This is what men do. So many, like, male-identified youth, they don't know that this is wrong, especially if it's a trusted adult like your parent telling you what to do. Um, and then areas to address further. What are barriers for youth identifying as male or LGBTQIA? Again, we know that um, these are risk factors as well. We're just not seeing those numbers in the services that we're providing, um, which means there's a disconnect between youth coming forward and accessing services. Um, how can we better address overrepresentation of ethnic minorities and LGBTQIA clients as well? And then how do we expand general community identification and awareness about services? So I think it's great that you are all watching this webinar because now you have more of an idea of where, what to look for and where to go if you're seeking support. Um, and if you've learned nothing from this presentation, it's that um, your one key takeaway should be that poverty and oppression allow trafficking to thrive. Um, so, Sometimes after these presentations, people ask me, what do I do? How am I supposed to help people like this? Um, so you just want to, again, build relationships with them, connect, avoid, avoid judgment, and helping youth make informed choices. Um, avoiding judgment can look a lot of different ways. Um, sometimes when a youth tells us a particularly horrible thing, uh, if we aren't able to keep our faces straight, um, and like neutral, we can maybe freak youth out in terms of saying, oh my god, and youth might say, oh, that's not even the worst thing that happened to me, but if my worker reacted this way, I can't tell them the big stuff or it's going to get worse. So again, keeping that neutral level safe. It's difficult, but it takes practice. Judgment also might look like assuming that something that someone has been through is incredibly traumatizing. I had a uh, I worked with someone who used to be in the life, got out about 10 years ago, and now gives presentations about, um, about her experience. And one of the things that she says is um, that, you know, being trafficked was not traumatizing to her at all because the sexual violence was so normalized. What was traumatizing to her was um, child, uh, child sexual abuse that made it like oh, oh, normalized for her to get to that point. So uh, sometimes people would come up and say, wow, you being in the life must have been so traumatizing and difficult. And she always felt a little bit alienated from them. So just remembering that something that might be incredibly traumatizing for us might not be so for the youth that we're working with. Um, avoiding assumptions and being aware of the disproportionate impact violence is having on ethnic minorities and gender nonconforming youth. Um, so housing, jobs, education, all of those things, um, they all do tie into trafficking because those are all potentially ways that youth are not getting their needs met and are willing to engage in sexual activity for those things. Um, supporting ways for youth to learn about healthy relationships, uh, fostering peer-to-peer -peer support, um, collaborating. Of course, none of this work uh, gets done without fundraising and money. That's necessary. Um, but one of the biggest things is inspiring hopes and dreams. Uh, a lot of these youth have been told that they're going to amount to nothing or this is the best that they're going to get in life. So encouraging them um, to meet their goals, asking them what is it that you wanted to do, what do you want to do when you grow up, how do, you, how do, we, get, how do we get you there, what do you think that looks like? Um, and then supporting positive outlets and systems changes to best serve youth because we can work really, really well um, with youth and be trauma-informed and be totally non-judgmental, um, but if we're not also changing systems that um, allow trafficking to survive, we're still going to be working with youth. 
ultimately we should be working uh, we should be working so that um, we should be working with the goal that eventually one day we don't have a job anymore because we are doing such great work. Um, and that is all I have for you. Um, the last slide is my contact information as well. Um, but I know we have some time left for uh, questions and other sorts of comments that we can talk about. Um, so the first question that came up, I mentioned the Super Bowl. Can I talk a little bit more about that in relation to human trafficking? Um, so there is somewhat of a misconception that uh, major sporting events like the Super Bowl um, talk um, increase amounts of human trafficking. Um, it's important for us to recognize that human that the Super Bowl is one day out of 364 other days where trafficking occurs. Um, that being said, um, there will probably be higher there won't be higher rates of trafficking, but there will be higher incidents of trafficking, meaning that because there are a lot more people going to be in town, more people are probably going to purchase. Um, but the rate of purchase pretty much stays the same throughout um, major sporting events. Um, the Super Bowl is great for promotional, uh, getting the word out though. Um, so in that way, it's impacted. But we know, again, um, trafficking itself isn't, um, the rates aren't going to go up, but incidents might. Just like there might be more assaults during the Super Bowl weekend and there might be more uh, arrest during the weekend. It's because of a higher just rate of people being around. If you are interested about learning more as well, if you you can look up, I believe it is called. Uh, Sex Buyers, uh, the uh, report on who purchases sex, um, has came out over the summer, over the summer of 2016. Um, and they also talk about um, how people, um, a lot of the times, it's buddies who are having bachelor parties, or they're going hunting or fishing opening. When those types of events happen, like uh, different types of sporting events or uh, opening events that way, we do see. Um, trafficking in those locations as well. I think this, um, I think presentations uh, for teachers would be incredibly helpful because oftentimes it is the teachers that, um, that are seeing their students maybe in class or not in class and have that uh, ongoing relationship with them. Um, Renee has yes, posted the sex um, buyer report, it looks like, and in the discussion as well. Um, it was that, done by uh, urban, the Urban Out, I don't remember the app, UROC, um, but it's an, another extension question. of the University um, of Minnesota also, did that report. Great. Thank you. Um, I think the other piece is that um, hopefully this webinar has been a great tool for awareness and understanding and learning. I know it has for me. There it is. It and is. Um, just sort of first step. So I Thank think you. don't forget to keep thinking about um, what's our next step or what can we organizationally or wherever, wherever our spheres of influence are, what can we do? And um, hopefully we will be able to keep that conversation um, going and, and thinking about that long term. I want to uh, thank Catherine for joining us today for a horrifyingly fascinating um, presentation about the issue here in Minnesota and across the, the country as well, and um, just enlightening so many of us. And I think the um, point you made about teachers, the person who asked about questions, I, I would second that. And I'd also second um, 
involving young people in awareness is a point that was really uh, well taken for me. Um, so members of student councils and um, any classroom youth who are, um, or youth in non-school non settings, um, how do we help support them in learning um, and awareness because that peer-to-peer -peer support and awareness is, like you mentioned, super critical. So um, I just wanted to raise that up and um, also thank anyone, um, thank all of you, thank um, all of you for, for joining in and encourage anyone to, um, to continue asking questions if you have them. Um, Catherine, any uh, last wrap-up words before we close out? Um, I'm just really grateful to all of you again for taking time out of your afternoon to uh, learn about this issue. Um, I think now that you Thank are, you. and a we did bit post the aware, link. I will uh, post it if again here on the discussion um, uh, pod for you to tell them how um, if you want to share it with anyone. Know that all and, of our youth, um, we did send out an email, and if you would this. like um, some more information on that, um, you can just go on the on the link right there. So thanks. thanks again, Catherine, so much for being here with us, and thanks, everyone, for joining in. Have a wonderful afternoon and weekend ahead. Pleasure. And Todd, a reminder that you want to turn off the recording now.